You're listening to Missing Panther. I know what I saw, I know what's here, and I will stick by it. You know how you just get a sense there's something wrong? So I stopped and looked, and here was the Black Panther crouched down about four metres away from me. I could clearly see it was the panther and the long tail and everything. Two of their lambs were dragged up in, in the fork of a tree still bleeding. The next day they went out and they were gone. Two kangaroos come flying past me and I propped and uh, there it was in front of me, the cat. He would have been about two foot six tall, about five foot long and he had a very long tail. She saw the big cats on chains. The American soldiers were really, really good to the kids and they would show them their mascots. We weren't allowed to even go to the main river in town to go and have a swim or anything unless a grown up came with a gun. years there have been thousands of sightings of big cats like panthers and pumas in the Australian outback. Reports of a black panther roaming the region have been around for decades. State line has obtained amazing footage of cows covered in large scratch marks. Sightings in recent years have become more prominent. There's been a spike in the number of sightings. Farmers say it's the work of a large puma-like animal. Fears they're heading towards homes in the suburbs. The government can no longer ignore the video evidence. For almost 200 years, panther sightings have been reported across Australia in the thousands. Yet, there is still only one cat on the official record, the house cat or feral cat. The government denies the existence of panthers and large cats and they say to people who tell them they saw one that they were looking at nothing more than an overgrown feral cat or, in some cases, the back end of a wallaby just disappearing off into the bushes. For some sightings, sure. What about when witnesses were only metres away? and watched it move for 30 seconds, more. What about 15 minutes? Is that enough time to ensure your eyes aren't playing tricks? A lot of these witnesses that I'm interviewing are from the bush. Some have grown up there their whole lives. Is it fair to say that their senses may be a little more in tune to what's normal out there and what's out of place? I've spoken with property owners who have had hundreds of feral cats through the scope of a rifle. Should they not get a little more credit for what they see? It was no surprise for me to find out some of the witnesses I've spoken with had already been exposed to some media attention after reporting and, in some cases, filming what they thought to be a large cat or a panther. Panther-looking creatures that seem to never be caught. Just like the Loch Ness, the Illawarra has its own mysterious monster. The anecdotal evidence is so strong. It's not evidence if it's just an anecdote. <laughs> Come on. Let's do some proper news now, yeah, please. Let's. Some were not happy with how they were portrayed by the media for daring to come forward with their story. Oh, they were when they came out and took the film and all, you know, real polite and all nice. And they went down to Hillsdale Township. Obviously, they would have interviewed 20 or 30 people and they picked all the gills. You know, there's an old woman with no, no tooth and a bloke looks like he was drunk and some other idiot, you know, but they, they manipulate to make the situation suit themselves. Uh, they distorted what I said and, uh, you know, they made a big thing of it and, I wouldn't talk to anyone after that, that was it, you know. I didn't want to, well, you more or less make a fool of yourself, you know, they didn't believe you. Oh, look, so many people don't report it because of the media saying that, you know, we're all idiots. My husband was watching it and I got to the point where I said, turn it off. No, they really, they really treated me shockingly. Some now regret coming forward, for good reasons. By the time we got home, I'd uploaded the um, video and um, it pretty much started to gather a lot of attention. I think we reached at least 100,000 views within 24 hours. We started receiving a few threats. Um, we'll find out where you live. We're going to find out where your kids go to school. 
I grew up just west of the Blue Mountains in the country town of Bathurst. Although I consider myself a suburban kid, we lived on the edge of a vast span of rural properties. They seemed endless as a kid. From the back patio, me and whoever was my friend for the day would scan the horizon through a set of binoculars to pick out the furthest point before making it our mission for the day to get there. On this day, it was a hay shed poking its head up in the distant slopes and plains, which also meant the possibility of a tractor and with any luck, a lazy farmer who left the keys in the ignition. And so a mission began. Time to put on our best camos. Backpack, already stuffed with the essentials. Camouflage netting, Rambo knife, bottle of coke, and a packet of shortbread creams. It only became clear to me in my later years why I got chronic headaches. Our whole childhood was based around serial trespassing. As far as we thought, the land was ours to do as we pleased, and the fences were but a small obstacle. In our heads, all of the property owners were the enemy, keeping a close watch on them kept the adrenaline levels high. And like most normal kids, evading another capture just meant my ninja skill levels were well on the right path. As we cross the dry paddocks, the overwhelming scent of Patterson's curse fills our nostrils. If I smell it today, when I drive past an open field, the memory takes me straight back there. We never got to the hay shed that day, because somewhere in between we discovered what we thought was paradise in the middle of a particularly dry landscape. A long gully, around three kilometres in length, littered with huge green willow trees. The ravens disappeared and the colourful bird life seemed to be more abundance. The best climbing branches imaginable. An old ruined hut with a rusty windmill, a very deep stone well, a dam with crayfish and tortoise, a trickling stream which always seemed to have water no matter how dry it was. It was here where my childhood was born. We came back daily in search of snakes, frogs, tortoise, birds, foxes, kangaroos, possums, wallabies, and large rats, which is what we later named the place, the rats. But that's a story for another day. It was the great discovery of a duck's nest high in one of our favorite climbing trees that would go on to become one of the biggest unsolved mysteries in my life. When I saw that duck leave the nest for the first time, I knew I had to climb and see what treasures lie inside and I wasn't disappointed finding four duck eggs. We'd of course go back to check the eggs daily, but I never got to see those eggs hatch. After school, one afternoon I hiked back with an old friend of mine, Daz. He waited at the base of the tree while I climbed up and checked the nest. It was a good seven or eight meters off the ground and I always remember getting a little rush of adrenaline when up the top. It was this day that I looked into the nest and saw the eggs were no longer in there. There was something else. Three strange creatures with their eyes still closed and only a little fur. I remained speechless looking into the hollow as Daz was getting understandably frustrated below. I finally built up the courage to reach in and grab one of the animals. I pulled it out to show Daz, who of course had the same reaction as I did. What the hell have we just found? So we were kids who prided themselves on knowing every species of bird, mammal, reptile, anything wildlife in the local area. We went as far as learning snake scientific names just to outdo each other, which would have been handy if I went on to be a zoologist or even a herpetologist, but that never happened. We walked home in awe of our new friends, darkish grey, cat-like heads with big whiskers but unusually long legs and wide paws. We'd seen plenty of newborn house cats before. These were nothing of the sort, much bigger. Whatever these creatures were that we found in the old willow tree that day, didn't belong there. The discovery we made as kids has always intrigued me and now it's set me on a path to find out more. With more stories about panthers and large cats coming out over the years and thinking about what we found in the hollow that day, I started to wonder, is it possible? So, the time has come for me to do a little bit of digging of my own, to talk with those who swear they've seen something, something of the panther variety. But how do I find these people? The first thing that came to mind was putting an ad in the classifieds of a local newspaper in a place where I've always known to be the hub of all panther sightings. Lithgow. 
Nestled at the base of the Blue Mountains, Lithgow is rich in local history, and for me, part of that history is Panthers. So many people have reported seeing a large black cat over the years that it eventually got its own name, the Lithgow Panther. So, I called up the local paper, the Lithgow Mercury, and I sheepishly told them about my project and requested to put an ad in the classifieds calling for local witnesses. And to my surprise, they were all for it. And they even suggested a story about the podcast instead. A story in exchange for an ad. Sounded good to me. Considering every cent of this is coming out of my own pocket, I jumped at the chance. The day it went to print, I was actually quite excited. I guess I'm doing this. I was in Bathurst at the time, visiting family and being a neighbouring town of Lithgow, there was only one copy of the paper allocated for each news agent. So, I bought all of them. Kind of shot myself in the foot there when I think back. But I'm a sucker for a bit of memorabilia. It was also quite humbling to see my story didn't feature on the front page. I was way out of my league with Brenda and Collins celebrating 70 years of marriage and I was rightfully delegated to page three. So, the waiting game began. And just when self-doubt began to kick in, it was like I stirred up a hornet's nest. One of the first people to contact me was Robert, who has a story from his days of working at a local mine just on the edge of Lithgow. He claims to have seen something while on night shift with an old work colleague of his, Rodney. Okay, well, it was in the early 1980s. I was working afternoon shift with another person at a hard rock quarry just out of town. The crushing plant was built out over a, a quarry face, so the loading bins were up above the floor of the old quarry. It was a still night, the very well flood lit down below where the, the stockpile bins were. Uh, I'd walked out the gantry to check the, the screens and the, and the bins, and this black animal come up from where there were some settlement ponds off to the kind of the southern side of the, of the quarry, this very large area down the bottom. And I looked at it and I thought, what the hell is that? And I, <laughs> oh, it's just a gobsmacked. I've never seen anything like it. And I was pulling rocks off the conveyor belt and trying to get my mate's attention who was in the loader up feeding the hopper and I couldn't get his attention. So from where we were standing, it looked like it was grooming itself. So we got in the in the dump truck that was used for carrying the product from the from the bins up to the stockpiles, which was an old Diamond Rio, which is about the size of a Kenworth. Anyway, we we drove down and we pulled up to this thing, and I'd say pulled up within three metres of it. And this thing just didn't give a damn about us being there at all. So obviously it lived in the area, it was used to the noise and whatnot. And it just sat there and just groomed itself and had a bit of a scratch and you know, took no notice of us at all. We certainly weren't going to get out and have a closer look. And then I'd say we watched it for, do this for about five minutes. I can still remember it as clear as it had only happened this afternoon. And then it slowly it just got up and turned around and slowly walked back towards the settlement ponds. Um, it was very broad in the chest, tapering body with a very long, hard, swooping tail. When we first pulled up and looked at it, I, we thought the face had a very leathery look. But later on, we decided it was um, where he obviously been drinking out of, or it, calling it he, it had been drinking out of the settlement ponds, and that's where it was grooming its face, you know, with its wet paw. That's where we come to the conclusion in the end. If it wasn't in any hurry, it wasn't giving a shit about us. It put the wind up us, that's for sure. Um... I've got a I've got a very large male Rottweiler dog, and I would say it was about the same size. Well, on the Saturday, I, I can't remember what night we saw it. 
on the on the Saturday afternoon, the blokes had used work day shift, and the bloke had owned the quarry. Uh, and us bloke, us two, had used to do the afternoon shift. Uh, we used to go to the among the local hotels and have a few beers Saturday afternoon. We said to them, "Have you ever seen that bloody black cat wandering around out there?" Of course, we got ridiculed. Blah blah. You know, what are we smoking out there the night? Uh, so we just shut up. Never said another word. The next afternoon, the Sunday afternoon, the bloke at owned the quarry rung me. He'd been out to check on the on the uh, water tanks, on the water level in the water tanks. And he rung me. He said it was there when I went out this afternoon to check the tanks. And he said I drove up. He said it just disappeared. And he said, "What the hell is it?" And I said, "I don't know, mate." No idea. I'm, I'm no fool, and I know what I saw. Yeah, I, I, and I say this to people that I have told before. You know, I say, I know what I saw. I'm not stupid. I know what I saw. As far as I'm concerned, it was a panther or a jaguar. That's exactly what it looked like. After 30 plus years of telling the story, Robert's old workmate Rodney stands by the sighting quite strongly as well. I drove the 980 Caterpillar loader and, and Robert drove the dump truck. So I used to crush the, I used to put the rock in the, in the, um, in the hopper up the top and Robert used to go down the bottom and actually pick up the silica after it had been crushed and washed. Um, and uh, bring it up the top and dump it. And uh, that's all we did for virtually every weekend. It was just a second job. And that's how virtually how it all started. He was down below, um, filling the truck up with silica and I was up the top dumping rock and, and stuff earth into the, into the hopper, into the um, crusher. And um, then he, he sort of, the distance between the bottom and the top wasn't that far when I say the top and the bottom like it was that you know it was in sort of yelling distance but because I was in the ladder and the window the doors were all closed very dusty he um he he couldn't make me hear so um he actually he actually threw rocks at the window of the ladder not big rocks just small silica to get my attention which he did and, and that's when uh, I saw what was going on. But I do remember looking into its face. It looked like some, someone had bashed its face into a wall and it had a real leathery type face. But long tail, sloby tail, you know, it was a fairly big animal. This thing had a long tail, mate. You, you, know a cat, you know a big cat when you see a big cat. And it was a big cat and it was very scary. Like, you know, we, we, were, we couldn't believe our eyes. It was very scary. I wouldn't get out of the truck and go and and and, um, and and go up too close to it. No way in the world. I was actually eating sandwiches that the, the truckies drove used to come in and, and drop the when they were picking their loads up. They throw their, their crust out and their sandwiches out of the window that reflected. It was up eating that sort of thing, you know. I've seen feral cats. It was bigger than a feral cat. It was nowhere near looked like it. It was a panther. We believe what we saw was what we saw. Um, we thought, oh, well, you can believe what you like. We're not stupid. Both of us seen it. We're not silly, you know? For the last three months, Australia has experienced some of the worst bushfires in history. Lives have been lost, hundreds of homes destroyed, with thousands of people evacuated and displaced. At the time of writing this, there just isn't any foreseeable relief. When he's not running his full-time business, Rodney, like many other volunteer firefighters, are out there battling the blaze. I've done that much fire, firefighting this week, it's not funny, so... I'm going to go tomorrow night, 6 o'clock, I've got to go out, and we're going to do a backburn from the glowworm tunnels back into that fire if we can. Uh, so, you know, you just don't know what you're going to see at night time when you're driving along that road out there. From from all the fires, like there's 200 and something thousand hectares of, of bushland being burned in the Wallencampy wilderness. Um, if there's any animals going to come out of all this, they'll be coming out of that. People won't come out of the woodwork until someone 
starts to put something out because they they all get poo hooed and laughed at. But this is not a laughing. It's not a laughing matter because I can tell you now. It's Ned said serious. It's a it's a it's a, it's a big cat. It's not a not a anybody says it's a feral cat's a nutcase. I don't know what they're talking about. Over thirty years later, Rodney and Robert's boss Bob was good enough to back up the boy's story when he saw something very similar at the same site not long after. Rodney and Rob were casual weekend workers. I was a part owner of the uh, quarry. I I didn't directly work there. I was part owner and just happened to be out there on Sunday maybe to help out. I don't know why I was there now. And and I happened to be there starting early one Sunday morning and there was myself and another fellow. We were on the edge and looking down at that creek and we could see this thing that, uh, that we're discussing. It was certainly black, had a long tail, certainly cat-like. And it, uh, it came down to the creek and had a drink. It was uh, not panicky in any ways. Just wandered around for a while, had a drink and then wandered back into the bush. This probably happened over five or six minutes. Uh, now the fellow that was with me who saw it, he's, uh, he's passed on unfortunately, so uh, we can't use him as a comparison. It's not a matter of uh, collusion or you know, inventing something or imagining something because uh, they weren't there when I was there and saw it. The three of us did not see it together. It was only Rod and Rob that saw it together. Certainly I saw it from the same quarry, so it must have been the same animal. You know, people were making these sightings and making comments without making a big diggle out of it without rushing off to the press or grabbing cameras or making a big hullabaloo about it. Oh, okay, that damn thing's out there, all right. So, oh, yeah, I've seen it. Hey, look at me, I've seen it. But that, that's all it was. Just see, just accepted it as uh, <laughs> part of, the, uh, part of the, uh, the whole area, if you like. Yeah, it could, have been, it could have been a cow wandered out. It could have been a horse. It could have been a pig come out. This happened to be a big black cat. All I can do for you is uh, what I've said. I can confirm that the sighting, and I'm absolutely positive about that. It was definitely there. Born and bred in Lithgow and no stranger to the bush, Jennifer spent a lot of time around local wildlife, so has a good grasp on what isn't the norm when it crosses her path. My dog and I, like I usually take my dog on on an afternoon walk. Um, He was, this was, it would have been probably, I'm saying, between five and six years ago. And um, I was walking in the paddock, which is on the top side of us. Um, So it's grassy, it's not not overgrown, not a lot of trees. mainly just a grass paddock so I was walking to, to, to go back to my home and I looked down the paddock now probably between 200 to 250 meters I guess it would have been and I looked and I saw this figure and I thought what is that and it, it, it well it it was a black cat and it was a big black cat with a long tail and it was moving you know like your typical stealth walk that you see a, a big cat walk like next thing my dog spotted and he put his head up his ears were up but his hackles stood up from his tail right to his neck and he just looked now my dog's been a kangaroo chaser in his time so he knows a kangaroo from another type of creature and his reaction confirmed to me that what I was seeing was correct you know it walked up over the bank and then disappeared into the into the bush there. There's too many people talk around here about what they see in the bush and yeah. But I'm, to this day, I I swear blind. A long, long, it was jet black. Kangaroos aren't jet black, you know, they're the the beigey colour, you know, with a little bit of black on their tail. But this was, yeah, completely different. It's more or less like a thing that I think unless you've got photo evidence, people just think you're crazy, you know. I've told friends but um, I've never told publicly, no. 
but I, I do honestly feel it's there's something out there is something there I know in my mind that I I was I was I wasn't seeing things my sighting was a true sighting or I believe they're out there my brother um, has actually he was adjusting a horse in a paddock up the road from where he was living and he went up to um, to check the horses and he actually saw as I did this the panther and it was in the paddock near the creek Dennis has always backed his sister Jennifer's story after seeing something himself in the early 90s well where I live I'm probably about half a k up the street you go into a uh, paddock where I had my horses and there's a cleared area in the paddock there's a creek down off to the right hand side I, and there's a road that goes up through it it was an old mining site it was the old um, Zidag mine there and the horse wasn't I couldn't see him anywhere so I walked up the road through the paddock uh, up into there's like the old um, acacia trees up in through them and then um, the road sort of goes around just at the foot of the hill and it goes up the hill to the mountain sort of thing and uh, it just startled me because it just sort of come up out of the ferns and the blackberries from the right hand side up a bank over a bank it was it's a bank that was they used to dump ashes over come up over that and then it was about oh, 15 between 15 and 20 meters off me uh, so it wasn't a long way away it was close you know it just was it's sort of how they slink and i went i'm seeing things here i thought i thought oh, a dog no it's not a dog and then i took a good look at it and the, it just stood sort of um, crouching a little bit, not crouching a lot, but just looked fixed on me and I just stopped and uh, it just head half turned to me and then it half growled and bared its teeth and then j just looked at me and then just slinked off and went up a bit of a rise and then up into the bush. Knew I wasn't going to do anything because I just didn't know what to do. I just stood there and watched it. And then it just up into the scrub. It didn't bowl off in the panic. It just took a bit of pace to go up the sh bank and gone. And the body was too long for a dog. Dogs are more short couple than that. Uh, even the German Shepherds, not they're shorter couple, you know. The, the depth, they say short couple, the distance between their front shoulders and their hind hind legs, you know. And just just the way it walked, you know, it was sort of stealth. You could hear it. I heard it, mate. It just sort of gave a bit of a growl. And the, and, the, and the lips curled up and you could see you could see the teeth and everything on it you don't forget it I've had horses all my life I've been in the bush all my life I've, I've rode horses in the bush I've, I've, I've seen I've been riding horses in the bush and had to get away like being by myself had to get away from feral dogs up over what we call the Newns Plateau um, I've had to get away like move away from them and um, heading out towards the glowworm tunnels and places like that I'm familiar with the bush, I'm familiar with our native animals. You see a lot of ferals, like I said up there, people go up chasing pigs and they lose their dogs and the dogs then become self-sufficient and you've got to keep, their, they can be pretty nasty bits of gear, but um, yeah, you don't go looking for them, but they find you. But that, for me, to somebody to say to me, well, you know, you, you're imagining things, mate. I know, what, I know what a black cat is. I know what a, a panther or a jaguar or whatever that is. I know what they are. I know what they look like. I know how big they are. I know I've, I've bred dogs. I've bred Afghans. And like when you see something first up, you 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 sort of that shouldn't be there. That's just foreign to the area. You sort of go, wow, woo, you know. I do know black from white, you know. So. Glenda owns a small piece of land just outside of Lithgow and came home one day to see something large and black cross her driveway. She just assumed her neighbour's Shetland pony got out again until she got closer. Yeah, I was coming home from work. Um, so I was just driving up the hill into my property. Yeah, well, as I pulled up, I looked to the left, which is an empty property without any... Um, sort of obstacles, bushes or anything like that. And I saw a black animal walking towards my property. Because I thought, oh, what's the black Shetland pony, the neighbour's pony doing over there? That was my first thought. And I thought, oh no, the pony's out. 
so, you know, on a closer observation, I went to see, you know, what the pony's doing out. Yeah, I ran up as far as I could just to see through the bamboo, the thin bamboo I've got. And it was just looking straight towards where the chickens were running. And it hadn't seen me, it was just heading for the chooks. I moved towards it to get a better look and then I stopped and I saw it walk across my backyard. I went towards it closer to get a better look and I could clearly see it was the panther and the long tail and everything. Well, I went and rang the Lifgate Mercury and Lenny Ashworth, he, he was like the manager of the Lifgate Mercury. So straight away I got the call, you know, I ran inside and called him and I said, I've just seen the Black Panther. And he said, you're the second person who's rang me today. There was a farmer down at Hartley had rang him in the morning and said he'd sighted the Black Panther. I'm just going to be in a sem seminar at 11 till probably about one o'clock today. Glenda had to duck out to a seminar halfway through this interview. When I asked her what it was about, her answer was quite ironic. Seminar for seniors, how to keep safe at home. <laughs> I kept hearing that the Lithgow Mercury newspaper became a place for people to report their sightings after being treated like fools when reported to National Parks and Wildlife. For 36 years, Len Ashworth ran the Lithgow Mercury newspaper. Although Len was no longer there when they ran my story, I was told that he was the one person they called when they had an encounter. And although still quite sceptical about large cats, Len treated everyone's encounter with the utmost respect and curiosity. For a while there, we were regularly getting uh, reports of what people claimed to be a panther from all around the district. And you know, once the, uh, the first report appeared on the TV and people said they'd filmed uh, this black panther up on the side of the hill, the, uh, and I have to admit it was a strange young animal with a long black tail and everything. Uh, the, uh, after that, there were, there were regular reports of people saying, oh, you know, we've been watching the movement of strange black animal up on the hills. We're completely surrounded by mountains, we're in a valley. And people are regularly reporting uh, uh, strange sightings and uh, uh, I have to say I'm a, I'm a skeptic. Um, if, if there was a, uh, a large carnivorous animal out there, you'd expect to see uh, animal remains that you know, wouldn't be eating plants. We were getting the, these reports and uh, they were all all very similar, people saying uh, this uh, uh, big uh, black thing loped along uh, across the road in front of us. Definitely wasn't a cat, it was too big for a cat, long black tail. They all had a similar story to tell. There was, there was one credible witness, uh, it was a police sergeant named Paul. They, uh, the Lithgow police, do a uh, patrol uh, late at night uh, from Lithgow up to uh, the area around the uh, the Clarence coal mine, which is about uh, seven or eight k's out of out of town, and uh, he he told me that he was a total disbeliever in all these reports. And well, uh, one night they'd been on the patrol up there, him and his offsider, coming back in the Lithgow and near the top of the scenic hill on the Bells Liner Road, he said there was something across the road in front of him. He said it was a quite a misty night, uh, but he. He said, uh, this animal crossed the road in front of him, and he said, ever since then, he, he was convinced there's something out there. He said to me that up until that time, he'd been a, a disbeliever, but he, a, a skeptic, but he, he was now a believer that there was something there. Around the time that, that these sightings were being reported here uh, around uh, Lithgow, there were similar sightings being reported uh, down around Currajong, that area there. The only thing that took a bit of explaining, the, uh, it'd be more than oh, 20 odd years ago, I was on my daily rounds at the, uh, the local police station and uh, some guy from out of town came into the station in an obviously uh, quite distressed state and uh, 
He, uh, he said that he'd uh, pulled up, uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the 40 Bends area between Lipco and Hartley. He, he pulled up in uh, in there onto a track that led up to uh, what uh, 100 years ago used to be an old mine site up beneath the Hassan's Walls escarpment. And uh, he said he went in there to have a leak and uh, he said he, he noticed this foul smell and he said then he heard this really quite ferocious uh, snarling or growling and he said he was quite terrified and he said he disappeared back to his car very quickly and came in to report to the police. Anyway, one of the coppers went down there with him and uh, they went up this track and uh, out of sight of the road uh, they came across a, a pile of uh, bones of uh, quite a reasonably large animal but uh, no, and uh, quite a, it was a fair bit of smell, so obviously it was relatively recent. And, uh, but there was um, no sign of any animal, and whether it was a, a dingo or a wild dog or just what it was, I've got no idea. Out of all the reports, that was the only time there was any indication of something that might have been killed for food. So, uh, uh, a while back, uh, there was a guy uh, he moved up from Sydney. He's a playwright, and one thing or another, uh, quite a successful playwright. He bought a uh, uh, little rural property down the Hartley Valley, and uh, he uh, he told me one time about uh, uh, 12 months ago that uh, there, there was uh, some large, very large uh, black feline looking animal coming into his. Uh, Property. He said he and his wife had observed it on a number of occasions. But uh, I have to say that, that the people I spoke to were absolutely convinced that uh, the, uh, they saw something that was unexplainable. Good luck with your project. There's obviously something out there, but uh, I'd take a lot of convincing that it was a panther. How they would have got there in the first place, so you wouldn't know. Lynn Ashworth raised a good question. How the heck could a large cat even get here? Myrtle Bank Guest House was in Halls Gap. Um, it ran through most of the 1900s and was one of the most popular places for Melbourneites to come and holiday um, in the Grampians. My parents worked at my grandparents, great grandparents, as well as um, great aunts and uncles and the American soldiers, as they had leave, loved coming there. You know, my grandmother always spoke about being surprised at seeing these huge cats being led around like dogs. They, the, the soldiers stayed there, they brought the mountain lions and took them straight down to Victoria Valley and released them. If you're enjoying Missing Panther so far, please tell a friend about it and make sure you subscribe to keep updated on each episode. If you believe you've seen a panther or a large cat, or even if you believe you know how they got here, go to our website missingpanther.com.au. Get us through the contact page. Missing Panther is edited and narrated by me, Ben Bede. Music is by Warwick Party. Mastering by Paul Gomesall. <laughs>